find out what your cohort of contractors is and then start having conversations with people and just be reasonable about it. It's not good for anybody. There is this new tax bill to pay. The thing that doesn't work is when everyone starts pointing their fingers at each other, saying, no, it's your money. No, you should be paying for it. This whole extra employer's NI bill that's never been paid, really, it's never been priced into the market. Someone's got to pick it up. It's two people sat at a table fighting over the bill. Who's going to pay? It's only just turned up. So maybe you split it. Maybe maybe there's a negotiation there. 13 months ago, just before the lockdown, I had Dave Chapling on the show to do an IR35 special. We, we were staring down the barrel of a gun, we thought at the time. The legislation was coming in in April 2020, but lo and behold, it got, it got put back a year uh, for obvious reasons, the, the pandemic situation. Uh, Rishi Sunak, the, uh, the, the, the Chancellor, decided to push it back by 12 months. But here we are one year later, and it's definitely coming this time. It's already been formalised. Uh, but it doesn't come into into effect until April the 6th. Um, so I wanted to get Dave on again. I think this is a really important piece of legislation for the UK tech industry, an industry which has been heavily populated with contingent workers for the last 30 years. Um, I wanted to get Dave on to, to give us some advice, not only to contingent workers and freelancers, but also to business owners and heads of procurement. And he didn't disappoint. We went through lots and lots of uh, really interesting areas and topics and uh, bones of contention and various other things. Um, yeah, it was a really, really uh, fruitful interview for anybody who wants to get some advice on this on this topic. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's Dave Chapling. So Dave, how have you been? Thanks for coming back on the Tech Leaders podcast. Good to see you, Gareth. Thank you for inviting me back. I've been well, certainly very busy at the moment, you could say. Yeah, I can imagine. I've you know, you've you've been You've been coming up on my feed quite a lot recently. I can see you've been very active and, and obviously understandably so. Um, so before we dig into this, then I wanted to, you know, I wanted to ask you, Dave, if you, if you could just give a little sort of introduction to yourself, um, you know, who you are, what you do for, for those listeners who, who are not familiar with your work. Sure. Um, I'm Dave Chaplin. I was an ex-contractor myself in the late 90s. I used to lead teams of developers to build online systems um, in the banking industry, I was big into um, Agile before it was Agile. It used to be called Extreme Programming in the early days. And then I started Contractor Calculator, the website, and that's been running 20 years. And we provide advice and guidance to contractors. In addition to that, I have the company IR35 Shield that helps people with all matters relating to IR35 and off payroll. And I help people defend cases in tribunal as well. Wow, that's uh... Probably, I'm sure you've had a few of those over the last couple of years. <laughs> we well, the last one we successfully won um, was October 2019. It was the Rauk Consulting case. Uh, that was the last IT contractor to successfully win a tribunal. That one is going to Upper later this year, so it will need to be defended again because HMRC have decided to appeal. But um, there were some really good arguments in that case. Um, it's a great read for IT contractors and anyone in that um, sector that, that places IT contractors. It sort of provides a blue, blueprint of how to do it properly in some cases. Yeah, okay, great. So we spoke uh, back in February of 2020. Um, little did we know what was going to happen after that conversation. Was it 13 <laughs> months ago? Wow. It was indeed, yeah. Wow. It's crazy, isn't it? It, it, it Doesn't it feel like years ago? But <laughs> in some ways, but in other ways, it, seems, it feels like uh, days ago. But it's Exactly it's that, yeah. Mainly because I was listening to it in the car this morning. It feels like it was. The... <laughs> but, I can't but, believe um, that was thirteen months ago. Unbelievable. Yeah, I know, but it's so much has happened, isn't it? Uh, but it's it's bizarre. But so so talk us through what milestones have happened in the last twelve months. Then, well, I guess if you go back twelve months, we were still running the stop the off payroll tax campaign at that point, and we were trying to stop um, Parliament enact this new legislation, and we were going for a further two year delay. There was a vote in Parliament. Um, it went through to um, a division because we got the Labour Party on board. It was called Amendment 20, but we didn't win because all of the Tories, who were the rebel Tories and backbenchers who were on board, they decided to bottle it and they <laughs> allowed it to go through. So essentially by the 22nd of July last year, it became law and everyone had to then... Um, work towards what's going to now happen in a couple of weeks. So there has been lots of people who have, can't, aren't quite familiar with how legislation works, thinking there might have been a U-turn. 
but there's not really been any opportunity for a U-turn because it is law, it's primary finance legislation, it's done. It can't roll back now. Yeah. So I remember when we last spoke, we joked about how you were down there, you know, sort of a demonstration. I think it was a lobby day, wasn't it? It wasn't quite a demonstration. It was a lobby day. I think I said to you, congratulations, because the chancellor resigned the next day. And I, I put it all down to you and your, ga- and your gang. <laughs> but obviously it wasn't that. It was uh, it was other things going on, clearly. But uh, but nonetheless, just talking about that, that demonstration and stuff, you, you, you actually went into Parliament, if, correct me if I'm wrong. And you had a proper like lobby sort of session with with uh, was it thirty to forty MPs and they really that's right. listened to what yeah, you that's had to right. say and it was a really productive day wasn't it it was an it was an excellent day yes yeah I mean they they totally understood all of the messages there were some key people there we had um, I think Ian Duncan Smith may have been there David Davis certainly was I remember speaking to Steve Baker for quite a while and I introduced him to um, a lady Elaine who had actually won an IR35 inquiry and she explained all the hassle that she went through with it so they understood that this is a problem um, but unfortunately didn't get the votes would we be in the position we are now and would would what happened in July would that have happened had there not been a pandemic do you think I think it pro I, I mean the pandemic obviously contributed towards it there were major problems with this legislation going through at that point. Firms weren't ready. I think that provided the extra backdrop for an excuse to delay it another year because um, the guidance just wasn't there. I mean, it's much better now, the guidance from HMRC. They, they really have worked hard of it over the last year. There's some of it I don't particularly like, but I mean, lots of it is really good. Um, so they weren't ready. But um, I mean, we would have won. Um, Right up to the point when they went in, when they said clear the lobbies and went in for the vote, I didn't know what was going to happen. I thought we had it, but then turns out afterwards that Boris Johnson had nobbled personally a lot of those MPs um, and given them promises about things which never happened. You've been fighting this fight, so to speak, for for quite a long time now. So. And obviously, you know, this is kind of out of your control. There was so much more going on and all, 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 all this kind of thing. But, but what's next for you then, Dave, in terms of, you know, is the fight over? And, you know, what, 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 what's on your radar now for the next sort of 12 months and beyond? The fight in terms of stopping it becoming legislation was over when we lost that vote and it reached royal assent. So then the, the mission turned to, well, OK, the, the rules on the pitch have changed. We now need to play the game. They want to play the game. So we'd already been working on Shield and and, an IR35 Shield was either going to be for helping contractors assess their situation under the old rules or it was going to be for clients assessing under the new rules. So we just pivoted at that point and decided to help as many clients as we could to do accurate assessments. And that's what we've been doing really ever since last July. And we now have hundreds of clients on board and tons of assessments are being done. So we want to help firms hire people correctly. And if they're inside, then, well, ideally, we'd like them to go on their payroll. And if they're outside, then, you know, they can carry on as normal because not not all firms want to put contractors on their payroll. And and actually, they are genuine contractors. They're outside IR35. So that's sort of our mission, really, just to, to enable the people that want to work together in that frictionless manner to carry on doing so without all this horrendous admin burden on top. Yeah, are you seeing a sort of um, a situation whereby companies are panicking and they're just determining everybody, everyone's blanket inside IR35 because they don't want to carry any risk on their balance sheet? Is that what you're seeing? Is that or was that improved a bit in the last sort of six months? Well, that that's nuanced. Um, we've certainly seen firms say a blanket ban. Now, a blanket ban is entirely different to a blanket determination. A blanket ban just says, we can't be bothered to deal with this. Everyone's going on payroll. So that's happened, particularly in the finance industry. And there are other large firms that have done that too. But they have found that that has caused them trouble. There's definitely leaks. There's leaks in the finance sector. There's leaks in the telecom sector where that hasn't worked for them. I happen to know that, for example, at um, a large postal company, we shall say, 90% of their cyber team have just walked out. And they've had to outsource that to a consultancy, which is going to cost them a hell of a lot more. Projects will be delayed and cancelled. So it's not a good idea to do a blanket ban. But lots of firms have done that because they just had all of the uncertainty. And I think um, it's a new thing, isn't it, for them? 
to, to have to do these assessments and to learn this in a short space of time is difficult. And HMRC spend three to five years training their inspectors how to do status determinations and run status cases. So firms can't do this and they see it as this one great big scary horrible monster. But it, it's not really. Um, the determinations are difficult, but the rest is just admin. It's not that hard. So we've seen that. Blanket determinations are ones where they say, we're going to tell you all that you're inside IR35 or outside IR35. Those don't work. And firms need to be really careful about this because if they use a blanket determination, they've not adhered to reasonable care. And an agency could just pay, well, and should in, in law, pay that money gross to the contractor. They, the agency has no uh, lawful basis on which to make deductions at that point if a blanket determination has been done. So the agency could actually just pay the contractor gross, don't tell, doesn't tell the client, and the client could have all this money running up on their balance sheet and have absolutely no idea and think they've done the right thing. So not a good idea. Either do it properly <laughs> or yeah. don't do it at all and, and take on all the extra costs of deciding to put everyone on payroll. Yeah, definitely. So, so let's talk about status determination very quickly then. What do you, I think I recall you being quite critical of a HMRC tool, if, if I remember correctly. What's your stance on that now? Um, well, it's just as bad because I haven't changed it. So everything I said before still stands. The The problem with the, the CES tool, Check Employment Status for Tax, is it, that it doesn't align with the case law. It aligns with HMRC policy view of what the law is, particularly in the area of mutuality of obligation. And if there are contractors that are outside IR35, particularly if it's based on substitution, then it doesn't matter what they say on anything else on that tool. If they've got an unexercised right of substitution, it says they're outside. Now, I wouldn't go to court and defend someone if that's the case, if all of the other indicators were poor, because that's not going to work. Judges will just set aside those dodgy clauses. So it can give people um, false, uh, a false sort of reading, I guess, false hope that everything's okay. So you need to be careful in that respect. If you can't pass, um, if you aren't allowed to substitute and there is um, not really, and there is some control, then it will tell you you're inside IR35 or don't know. So because it set the bar so high, it's going to tell the client that mainly, I mean, for classic contractors, it's going to say, that it's unable to do a determination. I do a webinar on this um, and, and I show people how you put a classic contractor through. I put the contractor through that was in the route consulting case and I show it just says unable to determine. So it's just not really helpful, really. I call it as useful as a chocolate teapot. <laughs> so let's, let's, you mentioned case law there. So let's talk about that a little bit. You, uh, I know you, you've been involved in some high profile cases. Most recently, the one I remember was uh, Kay Adams, uh, the BBC presenter. That case and cases of that nature, what have they done for the way this is interpreted by HMRC? What, what's, what what's come out of those cases? Well, I guess you, in, in some of those high-profile pro, high cases, particularly the Kay Adams one, um, there's some nuances in law that have come out of that one. Now, she, had, she went to first-tier tribunal. That's where you do your facts and the decisions made. But then it was challenged by HMRC at upper tribunal. And... They remade the decision, but still said that she was outside. But what's um, very interesting about that particular case is that they said that all the pointers in, in the case law in pointers were towards one of deemed employment. But because she was in business on her own account, that didn't matter. And therefore, she was outside IR35. So this takes us into a very tricky area. How does a client check to see whether a contractor is in business on their own account because the contractor has all of that information and it's private and confidential. They don't have to put out their whole 20 year career history of who they've worked for and how much and so on to decide if they're in business on their own account. So um, I think we're likely to see that one challenged. Um, it's very fact specific about her and her case and it doesn't really provide um, lots of contractors, particularly the types we know about that do one contract at a time. It, I don't think that case gives everyone sort of a, a trump card to say, hey, I'm a, I'm a Kay Adams. 
these freelancers who work in these type of industries, you know, like entertainment and things, it, it is quite different, isn't it, to be in, for example, an IT contractor, like which is your background, where you work in nine to five, you are a little bit closer to a full time employee doing that, aren't you? So, what can the average contractor take from maybe that case or a similar case like that? So, one thing you can take from the Kay Adams case is the word circumstances. Now, the circumstances are very important when you're judging a case to see whether it's inside or outside IR35, we have to consider the contract and we have to consider the working conditions and the conduct of the contract, the circumstances. Both need to be considered. One doesn't necessarily trump the other. You want to have them in alignment for everything to be okay. When they're not in alignment, HMRC could say, well, that contract is maybe a sham. You've put clauses in there that aren't really the truth. And they might use circumstances that don't align with that contract. So circumstances is a big thing that's come out of that case um, and how you go around judging cases. But the same rule applies as has applied for 20 years. Make sure the contract aligns with what you're actually doing. Don't try and use a piece of paper to pretend that you are a genuine contractor when really you're a disguised employee. Just from a contractor standpoint, if you d- you are determined inside, okay, and you, you haven't really got much of an argument against that, then there's no point of having a limited company, surely. You may as well just go on the payroll and, and whatever. But what, what, would you, what, 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 what do you advise contractors to do in that situation? I think if, you're, if, if that particular contract is inside IR35, then I guess the gold standard would be fixed-term contract direct with the client, and maybe the agency gets a fee for introduction. The next one would be um, on the agency's payroll as an agency worker with full rights. Yeah, Yeah, PAYE, agency payroll, standard stuff. You're a temp, but you're paid a few quid. Um, You get the full agency workers' um, regulations kick in, so all the rights, comparable pay, holiday pay, sick pay, all of that happens. And then after that, um, you've got all of these umbrella companies. Um, That's an unregulated market, and you just have to be a bit careful if you are going to be pushed into or choose to work through an umbrella, there's not really that much benefit for contractors using umbrellas these days. Mainly the benefit is with the agencies because then they don't have to then take on um, the role of employer. So do your homework on that one. Um, I would say if you can get on agency payroll, that's the simplest one to understand because there's so many different models for umbrellas. Um, And I think if you're someone who's not really into tax or maths or know anything about that, then how do you even know that you're being treated correctly? It's it's quite complex. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank some of our friends. Firstly, all-round tech PR superstars Nelson Bostock. Whether you're an established technology brand or a fast-growing fintech, Um, You need the right team behind you, a team that understands your brand, your purpose, your goals, and and can really help you define your narrative and tell your story, the story that matters. Um, These guys tick all of those boxes and more. Um, You can find them at nelsonbostock.com. That's nelsonbostock, the CK on the end, dot com. Highly recommended. Um, I also want to thank Tramshed Tech. Um, We've come down here and they kindly allowed us to to, to use their world-class recording studio facility down here Um, but they do office space they do events Um, I can't recommend them enough that's tram shed tech and also a big shout out to be digital uh, who who make all this possible Uh, be digital enable organizations to become lean agile and to attract the right talent that's be digital uk.com work with agencies at all then Um, because obviously a lot of agencies I I would have thought would have been resistant to putting people on their payroll to place them on client sites or are you seeing more of that happening is that is that becoming commonplace now and I'm talking about the professional subcontractor part of the market not temps okay we work with quite a few agencies typically those agencies want us to do assessments for them because they may have had an outside assessment from the client, but they don't really trust the robustness of it. So they want us to do one to make sure they've got good backup, particularly if they have assessed assessment. They're not going to, it says outside, they're not going to trust that. They want to do their own one. Um, now, in terms of payroll, yes, we're seeing 
Um, I mean, the larger agencies all have payroll anyway. Um, the smaller agencies, they always used to like using umbrellas because it's just easy, isn't it? And also they earn money because they get paid by the umbrella commissions, don't they? The number of contractors they push their way. So um, previously it was a cost for them rather than being a revenue generator. But what we're now seeing is um, managed payroll bureaus um, coming into the market. I think they've been around for a while. So, I mean, they, these firms have been around for years. So you can either get your own piece of software and it's like a pound a timesheet. Or you can do a managed payroll bureau and it might be a tenner, something like that. Are you seeing a lot of this then? Because I've seen situations recently whereby there are outright employment agencies, okay? All they've ever done is, so to speak, body shopping. And I don't mean that in a derogatory term. You know, obviously, they, they just talent search or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And yeah. what they're doing now is they're setting up like a subsidiary called, you know, say they call Agency X. So they set up Agency X Solutions. And then they position themselves, as a, and they, you know, and then they say, oh, no, we just do statement of work agreements and completely circumnavigate IR35 because the, the agreement is different. You know what I mean? So and then they'll take on the risk of, of whatever, whatever the risk is. Then um, are you seeing have you seen much of that happening? I haven't seen it, but I have heard about it. Um, I think that is an extremely dangerous device for some agencies if they think they are actually setting up their own consultancy. If they are choosing the workers, if they're managing the services, if they're taking on responsibility for those services being delivered, that's what a consultancy does. But you can't pretend to be a consultancy when you're not, can you really? You know, you're just supplying bodies, don't of you? Of course. And HMRC wouldn't wash with them, surely. They'd, they'd look at the credentials, the, the background, the case studies. You know, if there's nothing there, surely it's going to be a, a, red, a red flag, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You could drive a coach and horses through that easy. Easy. Yeah, of course. So let's talk about VAT then, Dave. Obviously, everyone's favorite subject. So uh, this, there seems to be a lot of confusion around this, okay? When, you, when you're deemed inside, what's the VAT situation there? Deemed inside, assuming that you carry on working via your limited company, and then they are going to make tax deductions, that's what means working inside under Chapter 10. That's what it means. You're still with your limited company. So because you're, and this isn't very common, by the way, most people will end up going on payroll or a, a contract directly with a client or however they do it. So it's quite uncommon to be working under the deemed model, um, particularly after the Uber case as well, because you, know, you could easily claim rights. There's a good chance that you could do that. So, but theoretically, uh, pre-Uber, what would happen is that you would say for a, a thousand pounds that you have on an invoice that goes out to the um, agency and then client, there'll be 20% VAT on that. So that £200 VAT, that comes back to, to you as the PSC and you're supposed to hand that over to HMRC. But the £1,000 you've invoiced, that gets treated as um, employment income and has um, PAYE and employees and I deducted from it. So you're still collecting VAT even though you're a deemed employee which is totally ridiculous. Um, I just don't, th I don't think engaging on an inside basis via your own limited company is sensible in any way, shape or form. No, of course. So have you heard of any contractors disputing the determination and then sort of getting the, the company to really look at the case and changing their mind and, and then deeming them outside? You know what I mean? Have you ever seen that successfully happening? Because a lot of contractors will be thinking about this at the moment, you know? I don't have lots of data on this because... The way we work um, is very much dispute prevention. Let's just do it right from the start so that there's no room for someone to say, well, actually, you've got this wrong. Um, so if you, put, if you put the right processes in place, there shouldn't really be disputes. Um, the disp we have heard of contractors doing disputes whereby they're saying, well, actually, the information that you've given me in this SDS is actually wrong, um, and it should be this. Then there's the other type of way of disputing, which is just to completely discard the SDS that's been provided, for example, if it's won by CEST, um, and just put in your own reasons as to why you think you're outside IR35. And then, of course, you've got the other type of dispute that has no basis in law and is just a contractor having a whinge and they don't really understand the law. That's not going to work. Um, so if you are going to do a dispute, you need to do a good one. And that's going to cost you a few quid to do that. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. So you were on Moneybox on BBC Radio 4 uh, recently talking about um, some controversy around uh, withholding sick pay. Can you, can you talk us through uh, what that situation was and, and, um, and how that is you know, potentially important? Yeah, so um, it's actually, uh, it was the BBC Moneybox programme on Radio 4. 
And the controversy was around um, the discovery that some umbrella companies had been withholding holiday pay from contractors, not sick pay, holiday pay, um, to the tunes of thousands of pounds. Um, and what had happened was that these people had taken holiday over Christmas. Um, and of course, you accrue holiday. If you're on a, an accrued model, you accrue the holiday at 12.07% on top of your rate. And they asked for that to be paid in January. And the umbrella company said, well, no, you should have claimed that last year. Sorry, uh, look at your contract. And, and there was thousands and thousands of pounds at stake. And they threatened to take them to an employment tribunal. And then they decided to pay out. Um, and since that program, there have been more people that have come forward. Um, and there's the similar pattern of behavior across the market. But, but is this endemic across the industry, I'm saying, Dave? Or is it just one or two suppliers? Or one, uh, no, I'd go with endemic. Yeah, I'd go with endemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where holiday pay is being retained. I mean, we've even heard cases where the umbrella retains the holiday pay and then they share half of that with the agency. Well, I'm not sure, but I think that might be a breach of the Bribery Act. I mean, it's very, very serious what's been going on. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens with this over the next few weeks. So what, what should contractors do who've been in this situation? Do you say just, just call, um, call call HMRC or something, is it? Or was there any, anywhere in particular where they can go to get advice? Yeah, it's an employment issue at the moment. They can go to um, Umbrella Reclaim is, a, um, I guess, like a... a um, I was going to say ambulance chasers, but... Um, like a no-win, no-fee sort of thing. It's, it? a no, it's a no-win, no-fee. I think you pay 100 quid or something, umbrella reclaim. Uh, I'm not commercially involved with them or anything, but um, you can go there and they might process your claim. They're getting, they've got like 1,200 contractors all together and they're going to do a group claim. Um, if you wanted to do it yourself, you probably need to get your claim in by the end of this month. So you've got a week because you would be claiming to the employment tribunal yourself and you have to do it within three months. Um, Otherwise, you, you run out of time. Um, so, yes, you could go to an employment tribunal. But, I mean, get, get your facts right first because um, it might be that you don't have a case. So do your fact find and get an opinion first to make sure you've got it right. And if you have got a problem, really the first port of call is go to the umbrella and say, can I have my money, please? And if they say no, then, then you deal with it through the legal routes. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk about the immediate period after April the 6th. Okay, so when, you know, the legislation sort of, you know, gets formalized or whatever, then um, who is who are sort of at that? There's going to be a lot of companies carrying risk right now. And there's going to be over the course, you know, for, for a long time, obviously, or the or perceived risk, at least. Who are HM, HMRC going to go after? Yeah, are they going to they going to make it an example of someone? Um, you know, do, do SMEs need to fear anything in the immediate term? Well, what's your view on, on who's going to be the sort of scapegoat? And, and you know, are HMRC even going to start prosecuting or are they going to be quite lenient initially, do you think? Um, hmm. I think they will. I mean, crikey, there's so much low fruit. Um, I think they will go after firms that haven't got things done properly, aren't doing status determinations properly. They're getting it wrong. And they will try and help them get their act together. Um, and if they don't get their act together, then maybe they will intervene. Um, they say it will be a light touch. They say light touch on penalties, but that's a little bit misleading because the uh, penalties are only due um, if you've been negligent and careless and all this kind of thing. Well, um, you still got to pay the tax, right? If you haven't paid your tax, you still got to pay your tax. So um, I think for people that haven't got it right, um, they're going to have some tax bills and some nasty tax bills. But they, I don't think they'll be coming in after month one because there's no money money in it for them. I think they'll probably wait you know, sort of six months. They might, they're might. they probably trying to help people the first few months, and then maybe cases might start towards the end of the year perhaps. But we won't hear about these going through the courts because they take years. Um, so everyone needs to be a little bit careful because um, because there will be a period of silence where – there's not much noise uh, in terms of cases and people mustn't um, become complacent. No, of course. So I wanted to ask you about sort of agile teams then, because, um, you know, team like supposing consultancies who've got teams on site outside of IR35 delivering, you know, agreed outcomes, a true services contract, but the deliverables are constantly changing because it's a very agile environment and stuff like that. What, what kind of advice are you giving to your clients with in that situation, Dave? Because we were in that situation ourselves, so I'm really keen to know 
what what uh, what sort of paperwork do you need to have in place to, to sort of not combat that, but just to you know to, to obviously be aligned with what you what you're doing for for the client. Yeah, I think mean, I don't I don't I see no reason why if you're working in an agile manner it should necessarily mean that you're inside IR35. Um, individual tasks that are set maybe in your weekly or two weekly scrum don't necessarily mean that there's massive control over the contractors um, because ultimately they decide how they're doing the work. They might have flexibility over the time as well um, and how they're charging. Maybe there's some fixed price bits in there. But overall, it's about the scope of services. And if you've been brought in to produce an outcome, how you get there, and maybe you go a slightly different route because, you know, with Agile, you're testing to see what works all the time and, and getting immediate feedback from the business. That doesn't have to mean that you're, you know, the whole project's inside IR35 and, and you're being heavily controlled by the client. They're, control, they're controlling perhaps the outcomes um, or, or but um, I don't know, mini outcomes, but the overall outcome's the same, right? You, you want efficiency. You want to save money or you want something to be faster, slower, quicker, however it is. So it can certainly be um, uh, managed, I think. I don't, I don't see a problem with it. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Let's talk about the sort of uh, macro picture then. I was going to ask you about, I did. we did talk about this last time very briefly, about IR35 equivalents being present in a lot of European countries and have been for quite a while. Is the UK just aligning with them? I don't know enough about what's happening in Europe in all of the other countries really to have a uh, an opinion on that. Um, there's definitely a push um, in the general direction from a tax perspective and globally to try and get more tax from people that are moving to self-employment as we gigatize the economy because the slice of pie that's taken from that transaction is becoming smaller when people go into self-employment. Um, and if you look at some of the reports that have been produced by the OECD, they refer to it as the payment wedge. So that's happening all over the world, um, particularly in Europe. There's stuff happening in America as well, where there's something horrendous called the PRO Act, where um, it happened in California and tons of people are out of work because of it. And it has their equivalent of an IR35 test that basically says, do you have a name that begins with a letter between A and Z? You must be a deemed employee then. <laughs> so it's and even it's more not... draconian than IR35. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get more draconian than that. I mean, it's really bad for business. Now, they, the unions tried to push this and get this to, to go out across the whole of America. Um, Donald Trump um, didn't allow that to happen, I believe. You'd have to look at all the details. But Biden's a big fan of it, I believe. Um, I'm a little bit sketchy on it. But if the PRO Act comes in in America... This could be a great opportunity for UK contractors because American companies won't want to hire American contractors. They actually want to hire people that don't live in America. And for you, I mean, this is silly, but for UK contractors, you don't want to work in your own country because if you then remotely work for the countries in Amer for America, you're back to Chapter 8 legislation. You do your own assessment. Right? So it's, it's not a case of everyone swap seats, but everyone just work, don't work in your own country. Yeah, right. yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I, I mean, since 2017, there's been talk of a lot of trending towards sort of uh, offshoring and things like that, isn't it, as a result of the IR35 stuff. Well, what is your sort of take on the impact on the UK economy over the in, in the in the shorter term, maybe in the first 12 months after April the 6th? Well, what do you think is going to happen? Well, it's difficult to put it into any numbers. Um, and no one will ever really know what happens. There's so much noise out there from the pandemic. The granularity of measures um, that the Office of Budget Responsibility do and ONS, um, they, don't, they won't know whether it's made money or not. No one will really know. Um, I think there were some documents that came out by HMRC yesterday, uh, qualitative type stuff. It was all a bit cherry picked and claimed success. Um, so I think there will be claims of success, but it's horrendous for companies. They're all really struggling. Uh, contractors are fighting back. Some people are going on to payroll. But lo you've got lots of contractors saying, well, I'm no longer going to travel to do that job because you won't pay more. And I now have to pay for those expenses out of post-tax money. It's just not worth it. So there's going to be a reduction in the mobility of the freelance workforce. And that could affect UK PLC. Um, it's sort of the whole butterfly type effect of it is... Well, it will be damaging. It, it, it can't be anything but. 
Yeah, I'm sure it will. And just very quickly for small businesses, the small company exemption clause, is is that going to, uh, and um, this is public knowledge and maybe a stupid question, but is is this, you know, are they going to proceed with this or are they going to try and get rid of this over time? You know, do you know what I mean? Is it, is it going to be, is, is nobody going to be exempt, do you think, in a couple of years? Or I don't know whether it'll be a couple of years, but it does seem odd that there will still be a two-tiered system. Um, if I was them, um, I would be looking to have this bedded in, <laughs> if there's ever such a thing of it bedding in, and then then say, right, now how can we roll this out to the private sector? So I, it doesn't make sense for there to be a two-tiered thing. No, of course. So, okay, then let's, uh, let's, I know, I know we, we're coming towards the end, uh, Dave, so I, I wanted to finish with this one uh, and uh, maybe do a little bit of role play, okay? So, uh, so I just wanted to put you in the shoes of the, let's say that the head of procurement or the CTO of a, you know, medium to large size business, you know, you've got a, you know, 30% of your workforce, a contingent labor, maybe, maybe 20%. Um, so you're carrying a bit of risk. What do you do, Dave? What, what, what's your next move? to sort of, uh, you know, with this legislation coming up. How many contractors have I got? Between 100 and 150 contractors. Right. I've got 100, 150 contractors. The first thing is to find out how many of those are likely to be inside IR35. If, let's say, all of them bar 10 are outside, happy days. I just spend a little bit of extra money. And the ones I need to keep um, who are inside, I just pay them a bit more. That's easy. If I find that actually... All these people have been inside IR35. They haven't been paying their taxes correctly. I've got a bit of a problem. If my budget is fixed, um, I know that I'm going to have to pay some people more money. So I will probably have to think about stripping back some projects, um, paying some people more money, trying to force rates down on contractors where I can. Don't expect that to be too successful. I need to find the contractors that travel a large distance. Um, Don't expect them to turn up after this happens unless you're paying them a lot more so it's really um um a risk mitigation exercise to find out what people are going to do and i would say find out what your cohort of contractors is and then start having conversations with people and just be reasonable about it um it's not good for anybody there is this new tax bill to pay the thing that doesn't work is when everyone starts pointing their fingers at each other saying no it's your money no you should be paying for it this whole extra employers and I bill that's never been paid, really, it's never been priced into the market. Someone's got to pick it up. It's two people sat at a table fighting over the bill. Who's going to pay? Well, it's only just turned up. So maybe you split it. Maybe, maybe there's a negotiation there. Um, it's very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah. Use common sense and just uh, be detailed with it. Yeah. 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 That's normally the advice, isn't it? But uh, no, that's that's really good, Dave. So no, look, I, I really appreciate you uh, you coming on. Um, so so what's next for you then? Are you are you working on anything exciting right now? Anything uh, anything? What, what's on your radar? We do have something very very exciting coming out IR thirty five shield, but I'm not going to give you the scoop on that. <laughs> um, oh come um, on, Dave, come on, uh, <laughs> let us know, buddy. You can't build it up like that and then <laughs> cut us off. <laughs> no, can't tell you. Can't tell you. It will change the market. Um, it will enable firms to be to hire even more securely on an outside basis um, if they are outside. Um, but that will be coming out over the next few weeks. I might well be starting a new campaign um, because I'd like to try and help some of those contractors that are under the cosh with IR35 investigations but don't necessarily have the funding behind them. Um, and unfortunately, they find themselves in a position where the amount of tax they owe is less than the amount it will cost for them to go to tribunal. So they just pay up even though they shouldn't. And I just, I don't know, I have a problem with that. So I might be doing some more campaigning, possibly some crowdsourcing on something on that. Great. And if people want to get in touch to speak to one of you or one of your team to get some advice or potentially, you know, become a customer of yours, where do they go? IR35shield.co.uk. Brilliant. Well, Dave, again, thanks for coming on. Uh, really, really enjoyed it as ever. Uh, good luck with everything. And uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll catch up with you in the future, I'm sure. Okay. Thanks, Gareth. Good to catch up. If you enjoyed and took value from the show, then don't forget to subscribe and also feel free to leave a review. We would really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening.